Welcome to Wealthy Living Podcast. I'm Lisa, your host and founder of Wealthy Living. It is here that I have inspiring and insightful conversations to help you live a meaningful, connected and well life. A place to learn and grow in confidence and clarity to make choices that support your well-being both personally and professionally. Now more than ever, we are living in a world of uncertainty and a world that needs more compassion, more calm, more resilience, emotional agility and connection. And today I want to talk about meditation, a well-known practice that can help with this. So meditation is the fastest growing health trend in Western countries. It is no longer considered an activity only for the highly spiritual. It has become a tool used for everyday people and healthcare practitioners as an essential part of overall well-being. There are more and more studies showing the benefits of meditation and of mindfulness for the brain, the body, and, the, and for our emotional management, and even for our relationships. And with so many people experiencing overwhelm and anxiety with this change that's going on in our circumstances during this pandemic, it can only prove to be a beneficial tool. So to talk about the what's, the why's and how's of meditation, I have with me Kerry Slater. Karen Slater. Karen is a certified meditation teacher, NLP self-discovery master coach, hypnosis practitioner, Reiki master teacher and psychic medium. She has spent the last 26 years searching for and discovering the meaning of life, why human beings are the way that they are, what makes us tick, what we do and why what we do and how, why we do it, how our thoughts affect us and how we can be at peace and have purpose and to find happiness. So welcome, Karen. Thank you so much, Lisa. It's a pleasure and an honour to be here with you today. Oh, amazing. And um, how are you going at the moment with everything? Doing lots of meditation? I am, actually. I am finding that my daily practice, which is normally, you know, morning and night, I'm actually taking time out because I've got lots of time right now in the middle of the day to really centre and to really practice. Um, And it's really a time to be kind and gentle with ourselves because our energy is changing daily. Yeah, absolutely. So I'm thinking if we could start just because, um, you know, different people that might be listening today have some maybe people that have practiced meditation a lot. Some people may not have done it at all. I mean, everybody's heard of meditation or at least mindfulness. But what is the difference between mindfulness and meditation? So the difference really between mindfulness, mindfulness is really about what's happening around me right now, what's happening in my body right now, what are the emotions that are coming up in my body right now? And they're very, very powerful practices. You know, mindfully eating, you know, I'm tasting the food. What does it, what is the sensation of the food? It's very tactile and it's very, um, it really engages different aspects of the brain right so I'm, I'm being here in this moment I can feel my the, the skin my fingers are touching each other I can feel my feet on the floor I can hear the sound of my heater in the background I can feel the temperature of the air around me and they're all very mindful practices and mindfulness is about attention it's really about what am I focusing my attention on and you know, we bring mindfulness practices into a meditation practice, but meditation is going deeper again. And it's when you're actually releasing yourself from those, I guess, attention seeking objects that bring you into being very present. And meditation is dropping you down beneath that, beneath the thoughts. Where are the spaces perhaps between the thoughts? Focusing your attention on the breath and only on the breath is also a form of meditation. And the lines are skewed, you know, Mm -hmm. 
If you sit in a mindfulness practice long enough, it'll take you into a deep state of meditation. Yeah. Mindfulness practices to take you into a meditation. And so it's not as, it's not as cut a line as what it once was. Yeah, absolutely. So with, Meditation, like that's a really good little um, synopsis, I suppose, of what meditation is. And um, I still think that even though it's become really uh, quite commonplace and definitely um, entered our Western culture, it's not just this, you know, thing to do for highly spiritual people. But what are maybe some of the common misconceptions or myths around meditation? Well, a lot of, firstly, a lot, a lot that I hear, I can't meditate because I can't stop. Now, to put that into perspective, we all have this brain, we have this mental mind that constantly thinks. And unless you have been a yogi or a monk whose only purpose is deep meditation, then to be able to experience no thought is is really unachievable for many people. However, what you can do is you can slow the thoughts down. You can come to a place through practice and commitment of actually moving beyond that mental mind activity. So we cannot stop the mind from thinking. Hmm. Also, what I would like to say to that is we're so distracted by everything that's happening externally outside of ourselves that what often happens is it's not until you go and sit in meditation or in quiet, close your eyes to distract, to disconnect yourself from the external world that you are then aware of the intensity of the thoughts that you're actually having that you Mm. are aware of when you're going through your day to day. Mm. Only when you sit in meditation and stillness that you become aware of those thoughts. Yeah. So I suppose the common misconception is then that people just think that they can't meditate because they're not a monk or... (laughs) I can't stop thinking. And then the more you try to stop thinking, the more you think. And then it's easy too, if your nervous system is used to being on the go, when you stop, what will come up is, oh my God, did I turn the kettle off? Um, I need to answer that text message or that email that I got. Oh, I haven't done this or I haven't told somebody that. So we, we distract ourselves unconsciously when we yeah. go into meditation and just as an example so I actually sat for 40 minutes before in meditation before we got together here and I came in and out a couple of times the first one was for 20 minutes now that first 20 minutes was just filled with thought it was just mm. thought after thought after thought and wanting to be distracted the second 20 minutes I was able to go deeper And the thoughts slowed down and I was actually able to have an awareness of space between the thoughts. But that took me 20 minutes. Now, if you actually just go in and you're going to sit there for five minutes, really it's just going to feel uncomfortable because it can take longer than five to 10 minutes for us to allow them to move through without being distracted by them. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so, yeah, I mean, and that's true. And I think that's something that you said that's really good there for people to know is that even someone like yourself who is so practised with meditation that you do get distracted and thoughts do come in. And like you said, unless, you know, you're a practised, you know, monk or whatever that does it as their life, it is normal for most people to have thoughts come in when they meditate. And it's not about um, resisting the thoughts, just about, um, you know, sort of pushing them away a little bit and and recentering, so acknowledging them, yeah, absolutely. So being aware of them, being aware. I, I call them bright, shiny objects. You know, there'll be some. There'll be. There's sometimes the thoughts will be words. Sometimes they'll be images and yeah, 
daydreams that will arise. That's still a thought to take you away from the practice that you're in. And, and if we think about attention, so this is a mindfulness practice as well. I'm going away off on thought. I'm going to come back to my breath or whatever your object is in that moment. I'm getting, I've gone off on this story in my mind. Okay, I'm going to bring myself back. When we've never really been taught, you know, often people will say, pay attention. Mm. Have we actually ever been taught to pay attention? Mm. You know, if and we- if we have, it's been a, I suppose, a negative yes. feeling. Like if you've been at school in a classroom, pay attention now, or your parents talking to you and saying, pay attention. It's like you feel that it's, you've got not such a nice memory of it when you've been told to pay attention. That's so very true. And so this is a way of training your mind to pay attention and when you do meditate regularly you are actually more productive because you're not distracted from what you're doing because you can focus your attention yeah very good so you know how i said just in the intro there that there's been so many studies now that show the benefits of meditation for the brain the body and for the emotional management and even our relationships so let's actually talk about some of these and perhaps let's start with maybe some of the notice some of the ones on more noticeable level and then we can talk more into the deeper science and looking at the um physiological benefits and the benefits to the brain but just starting on a more noticeable level um what are some of the benefits that people can gain from meditation so i guess at at that at that first level really what you're going to notice are the physical benefits so when you're regularly meditating so when you're stressed when you are constantly anxious when you're constantly in that fight or flight response you are actually producing the stress hormone cortisol in your body so you meditate and even if you feel like it's really busy in your head this is another misconception people think that because i'm really busy in my head i haven't actually received the benefits of meditating and that is a misconception because when you come into that space you're actually allowing the fight or flight response in your body to switch off which stops the production of the cortisone hormone in your hormone in your body If we think about adrenal fatigue, so that constant stress being the adrenaline is always running, it gives the body an opportunity for that to stop. What you also are doing in that moment is you're lowering your blood pressure. Your heart rate actually slows down. Your sugars, the sugar production or the sugar levels in your body regulate. You also are allowing for the feel good hormones of dopamine and serotonin and oxytocin to actually be released into the bloodstream from your brain. Mm -hmm. So there's that. So then that's also not just on the top level. That's a lot of the psych, uh, the physiological level as well. So some of those physiological levels and also the benefits, I suppose, to the brain. So if you went a little bit deeper um, for those people that might be listening and are more interested in just going a little bit deeper with that, What are more like on a deeper level, um, what are people really going to gain for their brain for both short-term and long-term? So what it actually does is it, it, so on the studies that they've done on monks that actually do meditate and they meditate primarily with love and kindness and compassion, they actually fire off and activate and light up most of their brain yeah going on a deeper level what you're actually going to be giving yourself the opportunity is for the stress energy to release from your body emotions that perhaps you have not acknowledged consciously so by consciously i mean you haven't given them your fullest attention you haven't acknowledged them as human beings we are really wired to avoid pain at all costs and our emotions can feel like pain and so we could be carrying around deep-seated 
hurt or deep-seated sadness or deep-seated anger in our bodies that we actually haven't given ourselves the opportunity to release. And so in meditation, because you give the physical body an opportunity to relax on a deeper level, it allows for those emotions to come up. And obviously in, in meditation, you're encouraged to allow that emotion to be in your body, to feel it, to breathe into it. And then as you're doing that, you're allowing that emotion to release from, from your body, from your heart, from your mind. Also on a deeper level, if we want to go really deep, there, there is an essence of us that is connected to the whole of the universe. Now that's not woo woo, that's actually science and physicists have actually proven that everything in the universe is connected. So we're not separate from nature, we're not separate from each other. And so it actually helps you to develop a deeper self-awareness and it gives you safety and space for that personal growth, for that self-reflection. And that, and that I have witnessed over having particip participants come to my meditation classes in person and they've been coming for several years. And I've watched beautiful women arrive who have been completely uncertain of themselves. They've been in an incredible state of stress. There's been situations going on in their lives that they've not been able to deal with and not had the tools to deal with it. And so I've watched them grow and grow in confidence to believe in themselves, to be able to handle situations that arise and to view themselves and the people around them in a, in a, in a much deeper and I guess more insightful way. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, it totally makes sense. But, you know, it's so hard, I suppose, for someone who isn't into a meditation practice um, to almost go, yeah, 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 as if that happens. And so, <laughs> you know, it's like really hard to, to, for our brains to accept that those benefits um, can actually happen to us even though there's so much research and so much um, documentation to show that that is true and everything that you're saying is true. And, I mean, you've got the personal experience with those particular clients that are proving that to be true. A few things, though, that do come up for me when you share that is especially around this time when people are self-isolating or they're with their families and they, they're looking for these extra tools and things to do and, you know, meditation is obviously one of those things that can prove to be really beneficial. The thing that comes up for me is the support element because like you said, you're doing it in your classes, you're there for support. If people are doing it and trying it on their own, and they haven't, re they've been ignoring their emotional centers. They've been ignoring the pains, like you said, that may surface because they haven't been still. They've been busy, 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 and they're not really stopping and really connecting with themselves and allowing the pain. So what happens when someone's in that situation and they try this and maybe not on the first time or the second time or the third time because their brains are still so busy, they do persist and a whole lot of emotions arise, but they don't have the support of a meditation teacher with them. Like, is this possibly not a good thing? Well, there's a couple of things there. If you're starting out and somebody is first starting out, there are so many amazing apps that are available for you to download that yep. are really generalized mindful practices of the breath of you know a focal point a mantra and they're usually for short periods of time yeah. and really you're not going to be sitting in that practice long enough for that to arise within you however what you are actually doing is you are allowing your nervous system to settle so that you are still getting the physical benefits, 
your brain is still secreting the dopamine and the serotonin and the oxytocin, which are the feel good hormones. So that that is without you being perhaps aware of it is filling your body with the hormones and the chemicals that it needs in order to be able to deal with an emotion that might arise. Yeah. So if an emotion arises on you today, right now, and you've not done any practice, you've not got any tools and emotion arises, your initial reaction will possibly be to ignore it, squash it down. We eat it, we drink it, we shop it. We do everything that we can externally outside of ourselves to avoid feeling those emotions. So I guess if you're committing to a practice, you're giving your body the benefits of reducing stress and anxiety through those mindful practices and allowing the body to to flood you with the feel-good hormones so that when an emotion does arrive that is perhaps feeling negative or uncomfortable in your body, it's not going to have as much of an impact on you negatively as it would if you were sitting here just right now. Yeah, that's such a, that's, that's articulated so well and explained so well, Karen, because I think that, I mean, from my understanding of what you're saying is basically that when you are in a state of calm and a state of joy, that your responses are very, very different. And I know that we all know that actually for our own personal experience. I know that from, you know, so many of the clients that I've worked with and, you know, within my personal relationships, etc. that when we, we just are different. Like when we're happy, it's very hard when you feel joy and this like that dopamine rush in your body, it's very hard to make um, unkind choices or to be, um, to let the emotional overwhelm take over. So yeah, I think that that's a really good point and that's a really fantastic benefit of just doing even the small amount, um, even if you're not getting the long-term overall benefits, but even as a tool just to keep you centred so that you can, um, while, you're, while you're living with all the people you're living with, that you're more calm and more joyful and your relationships maintain um, a better status. Yeah. And, you know, there's a lot of research also that, and this is, you know, neuroscience really, and I'm not a neuroscientist, but I'm interested in it. But there is a lot of research that shows that when you have a particular thought, it actually triggers a hormone into your body. It it triggers your hormone center. Now that could be anger, fear, sadness, whatever, or depending on what the thought is, it will be on the other side of that and it will flood your body with those feelings of joy and happiness and everything else. And so this is where meditation is very powerful as well to, to bring to the awareness. Well, what are the thoughts that I'm having and what impact is that actually having on my body? How is that making me feel internally? I feel really uncomfortable in my body right now. What am I thinking? Oh, I'm, 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 thinking negatively about everything or I'm thinking fearfully about negative, fearful about everything in my life right now. So that's going to have the physiological response in your body. And, Mm. and, you know, if you're imagining that there is a tiger that's coming to chase you, your body is going to respond as if it actually is. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, so good. So apart from the myths that we talked about at the beginning, what do you think are common things that um, stop people or prevent people from sust- from starting and then sustaining a meditation practice? I don't have time. This one I love because a lot of people will say, I don't have time, yet most people can sit on their phones and scroll through Facebook for... 10, 15, 20 minutes. In fact, you know, they have that, um, the, I, I can't think of the word. The, uh, the, the, the top, how long you've been on your phone for for the day. You're on the phone. Now, if you were to take that and break it down into days, you have more than enough time to yeah. commit to doing a morning practice. And you know what? If you can only do five minutes or 10 minutes, then that's better than not doing anything. Mm. And so... And when, go on. No, you're right. No, I was just going to say that you. I picked up that you said a morning practice. Does it matter if it's not in the morning? 
Okay. <laughs> Whenever you have time in your day and you're actually, and you think, oh, I've got a bit of time to waste, I'm going to scroll Facebook. Instead of doing that, you could actually sit where you are and then just follow your breath in and out of your body. So by following the breath, you follow it. Um, so I'm breathing in. Okay, I can feel the breath going in through my nose. I can feel my chest rising or I can feel my belly expand. And then I'm breathing out. So I feel my belly contract. I feel my chest go down and I feel the air come out through my mouth or my nose. That is actually focusing your attention on your breath. Now, if you did that for say five to 10 breaths, you're actually bringing yourself into the present moment and you're taking yourself out of that mental mind activity. Mm. That's a form of meditation. Yeah. So that would be a good tip for people that are really struggling to start a practice, to start at just a place like that or one of the apps, like you said. Absolutely. I, I often recommend to a lot of my clients to just wake up in the morning and do that. Just follow your breath in and out of your body and just do that. Because many of us don't breathe. We shallow breathe. We're in that mm. state of heightened nervousness. Our nervous system is in that state. And so just the art and the practice of breathing is so beneficial. It actually increases the level of oxy oxygen that you have in your body. Yeah. And is it different if you breathe through your nose or your mouth? Does it matter? No, it doesn't. I know in yogic practices, there are different forms of breath exercises that will stimulate different areas of the brain and your body. But for this yeah. purpose, no, whatever comes naturally for you. Because what happens then is the brain focuses on how I should be doing it. Oh, yeah. I'm right. oh I'm not doing it right. So mm -hmm. take all of that away. Just breathe naturally. Another great one that I love is to breathe in for the count of four and breathe out for the count of five. Mm. Giving the mind something to focus on because really we're giving the mind the opportunity to have attention. So you breathe in for the count of four, breathe out for the count of five. Yeah, and also I like the one with the box breathing as well. So say in for four, hold for four, out for four, hold for four. Yes, yes. Not yeah, if I do that if they haven't done a breath exercise before. But, yeah. Oh, okay. That is yeah. good as well. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, there is quite a lot of hype around meditation and how it feels like, you know, today with it being almost like the buzzword or the thing to do, you know, and, med and mindfulness, that it's like almost the golden key to maintaining good mental health. Do you believe that's true? And is it a major solution to mental health? It actually is. I do believe that. And I'm saying that from my own personal experience, because at the time that I actually came, I came across a Smiling Mind app at the end of 2013. At that time, I was in a, I was suffering with depression. I was suffering from anxiety, stress. I was living in a very unhealthy way. I was also suffering from addiction. And I just, I was getting cluster migraines. And I was really deeply unhappy. And I just did not know how to deal with my emotions or to deal with the stress or anything that I had it, that was going on in my body. And I started out with the Smiling Mind app, morning and night, five minutes. I made a commitment to myself. I can give myself five minutes. And the difference that that made to my own personal happiness, my own personal well-being, and my own personal mental health was huge. What I, I was actually led on a journey to do a bit of research for a friend regarding mental health. And I started looking at the private hospitals in our, in our Melbourne area. And I wanted to see what they were doing 
for mental health or what, what, how they treated severe mental health um, because this was a really um, severe situation. And what I discovered was that they were actually using mindfulness and meditation to treat depression, anxiety, and stress. And they were actually, and this is the research that they had done, St. John of God was one of them actually, and the Monash University. And what they had found that there was an 85%, and this was back in 2013, so the numbers could be different now. There was an 85% success rate of not having to have as much medication and of the time between a reoccurrence episode using mindfulness and meditation practices. Mm. So, and most psychologists now will actually recommend mindfulness and meditation practices to support mental health and well-being. Yeah. I think, you know, and, and this is not to say that there isn't a place for medication. I, I'm not saying that in any way. And I'm not a scientist and I'm not a medical doctor. But yeah. what I am saying is, is that when the two can work together, because you need the tools to support you and it's, it can't just be a Band-Aid and you want something that's going to be long-term. And, you know, when meditation has been scientifically shown to promote the production of the serotonin, dopamine and oxytocin, which is really what we need in our bodies to support well-being, to support happiness, to support feeling okay, to, to build resilience, to have resilience, to be able to cope with the challenges that life gives to us. You know, I'm experiencing challenges right now. My, my husband is stuck into state for work and he may not be back for three to six months. So that's one challenge. We're facing the challenge of isolation right now on the planet. And, you know, we've got Easter coming up soon, not going to be with the family. So there's all of these challenges that, are, that we are being faced with right now. And so for me personally, having my meditation practice is a way of alleviating the levels of stress in my body, the anxiousness of the uncertainty, you know, uncertainty. What human being on the planet likes to be uncertain? None of us. <laughs> it's like to know what's happening tomorrow. What's our structure? Where we need to be? What's going to be going on? And so this is such a powerful tool to enable us to be able to flow more freely with what's happening around us. Mm having as detrimental an impact on our mental health as what it could potentially and is potentially having on many people right now. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that that's so true. And it is a great, you know, we're going through such a challenging time um, where there is so much change and so much uncertainty and people do need something. Like you said, humans do not like uncertainty and they need some sort of tool that can help them through these challenges. And meditation is definitely something that's, you know, proven like, you know, for all the reasons that you've shared today of why it can be a really good tool to help with that. I just want to get your opinion on the fact that is meditation, because we talked a bit about meditation and mental health and meditation being a tool to use in order to get through the challenging times as well as it having the benefits um, physiologically on our system, which then helps us. But are a lot of people, say, with mental health, um, or even just, yeah, with mental health, or even just generally when they're finding things really challenging and that they are triggered by different circumstances and not necessarily, 
the current climate because that's something that's really new and different. Is it possibly like trauma-based and is there a difference like meditation, is that just a tool that helps you cope? It doesn't help you necessarily heal though, does it? Like you still got to do the healing stuff. Like can meditation also just be another possible distraction from um, dealing with healing? Like it's just something that allows you to cope to get through a time, but is it different than actually healing something? Or is it a healing tool? I, I really, personally, I view it as a healing tool because of my own personal experience and the hundreds of clients that I've worked with who do have mental health issues that have introduced this as a daily practice. Gratitude is a daily practice. It doesn't take it, take away from having, you know, working with psychologists or therapists in any way. It is something that works very powerfully together. But mm. I can only speak from the research that I've seen and what I have seen personally with the work that I've done with my own clients. And to see how they have shifted. I've had clients come to me who have no motivation, have not been able to get out of bed, have not been able to shift out of where they're sitting in their current situation to being able to make decisions, to be able to move themselves out of a state of confusion and fear of making a decision, to be able to feel strong enough and safe enough to deal with the trauma and the emotions that they're experienced, have experienced or are experiencing in their bodies, to then be able to change, make decisions to change their life, healthier decisions, get a job, change a job, move out of a relationship, move into a relationship. I've watched people be able to make those shifts and changes just by meditating regularly. That's been my personal experience of what I have witnessed mm -hmm. in the people that I've worked with over several years. Yeah, well, thanks for sharing that. Because, yeah, I think for me, I was just wanting to clarify because sometimes people take one thing on and think it's the answer for everything. But I think it's really important that people also see that yeah, like you said, it's a it's something that works well sometimes with the therapists or with other people because if some people have got really underlying trauma that's causing them to be triggered by um, circumstances over and over again, yes, the meditation can help calm them and it can help bring them back to their centre and it can help them, therefore, like we talked about before, being in a more joyful, calm, um, less stressed physiological state to then be able to start working on some of these deeper um, traumatic things that may have happened to them um, that they then can heal from. Absolutely. And I'm being reminded of a, of a, a quote from Albert Einstein. I hope it was Albert Einstein. You, you cannot change a situation that has occurred by using the same energy, right? Yeah. You cannot. You actually can only create change by shifting and being in a different energetic state. So if you're in trauma or you're in fear or you've, you're in pain, emotionally, grief, ever, anything then in order for that to shift and change, you need to change your internal, I guess, um, physiology. Yeah. And so meditation creates that space for there to be that internal shift and that internal change, which then a flow-on effect of that gives you a different perspective on yourself and others. It actually encourages you to be kind and gentle and compassionate with yourself and others. Therefore, the lens through which you're viewing a situation past, present or future is going to be different. 
Mm. And so the energy is going to completely change in that. Yeah. Yeah. It is going to change. The fear response is going to change. The, the way that the body is operating internally is actually going to shift and change. Yeah, yeah. So good. Because I think that what's going to happen in, I mean, I don't know, you know, <laughs> but I kind of feel like what's going to happen at this time is with people not being able to have the distractions of going to work every day or going to the bar or going to the restaurant or do, going to the movies or doing all different things, people are going to be faced with maybe a lot more of their own um, internal traumas that have maybe been sitting there for quite a long time that they've used other distraction to not be um, in touch with. And so I suppose the reason for wanting to talk about that a little bit is because if people do come to a place where all of a sudden the grief or the post-traumatic stress or whatever is coming up, from things that they have kind of like pushed away, but now there's the space yeah. and they can't escape it as much. Um, I suppose I was just looking at, is it time then that they go and get support or can something like meditation help them in this time? Absolutely. Medit meditation can help them at this time, but I would always recommend if you're not feeling that you have the tools to cope, yeah. And definitely seek external assistance, 100%. Yeah. And is there any mental health um, diagnoses that of, you know, of certain people, certain, certain diagnoses that should not meditate or at least should not meditate without supervision? There are always counter contradictions. And if you have been diagnosed with a severe mental illness, then definitely you should be starting out with a, a, a somebody that's leading you in that or with your own treater absolutely yeah good I just needed to clarify that in case we have someone listening that you know might have some you know major mental illness that where they shouldn't be doing something like this yes you should always before, before implementing anything new into your into your um i guess your 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 well-being if there are concerns, you should definitely speak to your treater and just make sure that that's going to be supportive for you. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. You're connected to the right resources should you need them. I just wanted to come back to what you were saying about this being a really powerful time for people being distracted from trauma. Yeah. It's, it's even more than that. People who have been distra distracting themselves from perhaps they're not in a happy relationship, perhaps yeah. they're enjoying their job, perhaps they're not in a situation that they are wanting to be in. So this is really highlighting for so many people right now, where in your life is deep unhappiness? And it's confronting because... It's right there in your face now. You can't, there's nowhere to run. <laughs> oh, nowhere to run. Oh, you're allowed to go on your one exercise a day, so you can run a little bit. <laughs> or even if you do have addictive behaviours to distract you from what's really going on inside, you can't just go and retail shop that to numb it. Yeah. You know, you if you're in the home situation and perhaps your go-to is to eat to numb your emotions, then everyone's aware of how much you're eating and how much you're going to the, the cupboard. Yeah, we're going to be, we're going to come out of this as fat alcoholics. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but this is the thing, there's nowhere to hide. So this is really a, it can potentially be quite a distressing time for many people right now. Absolutely. And if you don't have the tools and, and practices that you can go to to support yourself and your own mental health and well-being, it, it can be quite challenging. And, and I want to draw attention also to um, a study that was done with Tibetan monks who practice the, the metta loving kindness, which is a beautiful form of of meditation and it really is about wishing well to others and to everyone on the planet as well as allowing that to come back to yourself 
And they have actually studied, shown, uh, the research on that has actually shown that the long-term ongoing effects to your resilience, your emotional intelligence, your ability to be empathic, to feel appreciation, to feel gratitude. It's just, it's long-term. What's that, what's that type of meditation called again if somebody wants to look it's it up? M-E-T-T-A, yep. loving kindness, meditation. I'll try and find a link and put it on the show notes. That would be great. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Ah, oh, yeah. I mean, look, it's such a, it's such an interesting time that we're all going through and different people are coping differently. And I think for me, it's been quite a roller coaster. You know, I sort of went a little bit earlier on through maybe some of those um, overwhelming times of a bit of shock and, you know, my nervous system was on over, overdrive and, um, you know, I started getting quite a bit of anxiety. And then I made a decision to disengage from things that were causing me the anxiety. So I disengaged from news and reading certain articles and conspiracies and all different stuff like that and just came back to myself. And, you know, I suppose that's my own type of meditation. Um, I also do a little bit of um, some guided meditation as well, but um, really coming back to me. And it just is such a difference when I did that. Um, than when I was getting caught up in all the external. So yeah, it's it's a crazy time. And I think that for a lot of people, it's like um, the polarities are just like one minute you're this and then one minute you're this and you think you're fine and then you think you're not fine. And I think that, you know, it's enough to cause anyone to think that they're insane. <laughs> yes, absolutely. And it really does feel like a roller coaster. It feels yeah. like waves and from one day to the next. And this is really where it's so important for us to be okay and just accept where we are at in any given moment. We're feeling sad today and that's okay. Yeah. I'm angry today and that's okay. I'm feeling upset today and that's okay. I'm feeling anxious today and that's okay. Mm. It tends to be when we're trying to run away from where we're at that actually can cause more of that discomfort within our nervous system and our body and in our emotional health and well-being. So yeah. accepting, and this is really, you know, and this is what meditation teaches you as well, regardless of what the practice is, it mm. enables you to have a level of acceptance mm. because, we cannot control anything outside of ourselves. No. We really can't. We can't control another person's behaviour. We can't control what's happening globally. We can't control how people accept us or respond to us or anything else like that. You know, we can't control the seasons. We have no control over anything really other than our own internal state, how we yeah how we choose to act. That's what we have control over. And so this is a real, this is really triggering, I would imagine, a lot of people who do try to control things outside of themselves. So meditation really gives you that tool to have a deeper sense of acceptance and allowing you to disengage from setting expectations on people, places and things outside of yourself to actually fulfil you and give you happiness. Yeah. And, I mean, this is all stuff that is so... Um, we see so much literature on now, so much more than we ever did. You know, this sort of stuff was only really talked about in the spiritual world. And now with the growth of the personal development industry, obviously this stuff has really become a lot more mainstream and people are still, I think, navigating it. Um, there, I know with a lot of people that I've worked with, um, they know this stuff, but the integration of it is the really tough step. And I think that's where it's really important to be able to get support or listen to, if you're going to do the meditation, to listen to starting off listening to apps. Um, you know, I've used the Sam Harris app, which is really good. 
um, which is just 10 minutes of meditation and some teachings and um, time, you know, at this time now, I think that Mindful in May, um, which is a meditation, a global meditation program is being launched. So um, that's maybe a really good one to get onto at the moment as well. And um, and maybe, I don't know, Kerry, are you doing online stuff at the moment or are you just doing... Um, you're just giving that a miss from your classes at the moment and just concentrating on your one-on-ones. I'm still, I run several classes online. So I have an online live meditation class that I do via a private Facebook group uh, every second Tuesday evening. Yeah. I also have, I guess, extended meditations that I've recorded that are available for purchase and download from my website. So if people wanted to either download any of those or wanted to get in, um, wanted to get on board one of your classes, where would they find that? So they'll find that at my website, Holistic Essentials Therapy and Consulting, under Services, Meditation, and then the subscription is there where you can sign up. Yeah, and if they go to your Facebook page, that's the same? Absolutely, yes. And, the, and under the Facebook page has the the private group or is that just the private group if you sign up through your website private group is if you sign up through my website at the moment i have been doing quite a bit live on my facebook page just got yeah. breath exercises gratitude whatever i'm excited to do on that day actually <laughs> Yeah, fair enough, fair enough. And, you know, and it's good because so many people are offering a whole lot at the moment, which is um, which can be both actually overwhelming and a little bit noisy. Um, but if you do find someone that you really um, connect with, then just following them and basically maybe trying to get a little bit more um, into, into the practices. And who knows how long we're going to be um, in this situation for. But I think it'll be long enough to be able to create a habit. So if you can take advantage of this time and maybe start start thinking about creating a habit that won't only be good for the challenge that we're in currently, but enables you to be able to, um, to approach challenging situations in your life, which will never ever go away because your life will always have challenging situations, whether you like it or you're not, or you don't. And it's, again, it's about how you control or respond or react to those situations and how you manage them and navigate them. So if you can get into the practice now, um, it will actually be something that can benefit you throughout the rest of your life. So I really highly encourage for you to jump on board some type of meditation even if it is a good idea to start with the mindful in may which is 10 minutes every day in may um, and there's a whole lot of really fantastic interviews around that as well um, or even sam harris's program or jump onto karen's programs or like you said the um, meter loving kindness ones or insight timer well there are so many options available now um, online so it's not um, a matter of not having them there or not having the options available. So yeah, you've got the time now and there's heaps of options. So I highly encourage um, people to get on and try to get into some type of meditation or mindfulness, at least practice. Is there anything else that I haven't covered, Karen, that you want to share with us? Look, I just want to flow on from that. You know, not only are you actually benefiting yourself when you meditate, it, it has a flow on effect to your children, to your relationships, to your workplace, to your local community. Absolutely. Absolutely. The ripple effects of doing, you know, of, of meditation and most times when you do anything that looks after your personal well-being, the ripple effects um, on all the relationships around you, personal and professional, are going to be so um, enhanced profound definitely yes yeah absolutely so thank you Karen for sharing so much of your knowledge and your wisdom with us today and um and I yeah I'm gonna jump on and do one of the meditations with you because <laughs> I probably need to do that so and get into my get into my practice a little bit more too because I know that there are times when I start and then I stop and then I start and I know that even having this conversation is a great reminder for me of how much I really just need to commit so yeah 
thank you for sharing sharing all of that with us and hopefully inspiring a lot of people to start addressing that part of their well-being so that they can get through this current time more easily as well as um you know an, a more joyful calmer life um with less stress going forward it's been an absolute pleasure thank you oh pleasure so what's your um biggest um, this is for the listeners. What's your biggest insight or takeaway from today's conversation? If you can leave a comment and let us know, um, it would be great. Um, both Karen and I would love your feedback. So either by sharing, um, asking, going to her social media platforms and asking her some questions or giving feedback or doing it on mine, that would be great once these episodes are shared. If you enjoyed this episode, please share it with your friends and subscribe to the Wealthy Living podcast on iTunes or the Wealthy Living um, uh, channel on YouTube so that you can listen to more conversations with wonderful humans whose stories, knowledge, actionable ideas and wisdom can help you live a meaningful, connected and well life, both personally and professionally. I'm Lisa, an integrated life clarity and wellbeing coach and a professional conversation facilitator. To find out a bit more about my services, you can visit my website at wealthyliving.com.au or connect with me on any of my social media channels. So until next time, remember, connection is medicine.